Let me ask you, how many of you, now be honest, how many of you failed your driving test the first time you took it, written or, oh, look at all these. Oh, I don't feel so bad about the story I'm about to share with you now. I grew up in Kansas. I was just turned 15 years old. At 14, I had already taken my written test, and I passed it. Just turned 15, and I was, I was taking my driving test. So the instructor comes out into the car, sits in the passenger seat, and I'm trying to do everything right. I, I put it in reverse. I'm looking all around me, checking my mirrors. I back out only to realize that as I backed out, I was facing a direction going out of the parking lot where there was a big sign that said one way going the opposite way I was facing. And the instructor just said, are you going out this way? I said, I'm trying to, to recover from this. I said, no, 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 no. I, no, that's one way. So I proceeded to back all the way through the parking lot in the one-way direction. I failed my test. And for those of you who feel bad about failing your first test, I heard a story this week uh, with, with the Olympics happening, and I, I heard a story out of South Korea where Cha Sa Soon... This lady's name is Cha Sasun, 68 years old from South Korea. She failed the written exam for her driving test 949 times. <laughs> On her 950th attempt, she finally got just above the 60 percentile so that she could pass. I don't know how long it took her to get past the driving test after that. It took her four and a half years, 950 attempts in order to pass the test. Most of us just don't like tests, do we? And yet tests are meant to expose the student to where they really are, to what they still need to work on. Tests are meant to prepare the student for something they'll encounter in the future. Today, we're going to read, uh, in our next series on exposure, we're going to read a passage from John in John chapter 6 about a test that the disciples were going to face. So turn in your Bibles to John chapter 6, if you will. Lord, we just ask you to open your word to us today and, and open our eyes and our ears to understand. I believe there are things you want to reveal to us that maybe we haven't completely seen before. And Lord, I, I confess to you that every time I stand at this pulpit, I feel insufficient and inadequate. But that's why you want us to lean on you because you are more than enough. So I'm asking you to speak your word into our lives today that we might become more like your son that you might expose the things in our lives that need to be exposed, that we might become the people you desire for us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. John chapter 6. After this, uh, actually a better translation would say some time after this. So the events that we've read all the way through the first five chapters of John, some time after these events, Jesus crossed over to the far side of the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of Tiberias. A huge crowd kept following him wherever he went because they saw his, mirac his miraculous signs as he healed the sick. Then Jesus climbed a hill and sat down with his disciples around him. It was nearly time for the Jewish Passover celebration. Jesus soon saw a huge crowd of people coming to look for him. Turning to Philip, he asked, where can we buy food to feed all these people? He was testing Philip, for he already knew what he was going to do. Philip replied, 
even if we worked for months, we wouldn't have enough money to feed them. Then Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. There's a young boy here with five barley loaves and two fish. But what good is that with this huge crowd? Tell everyone to sit down, Jesus said. So they all sat down on the grassy slopes. The men alone numbered 5,000. Now you need to understand, in Jewish culture, when you, when you read the word of God, you'll see often that only the head of household was counted in a number. So just the heads of the household, just the men were counted. So scholars believe this was probably the largest crowd that had gathered in Jesus' time on earth to listen to him. There were probably 20 to 25,000 people there. Let's, let's continue, verse 11. And Jesus took the loaves... And when he had given thanks, he distributed them to the disciples and the disciples to those sitting down, and, like, and likewise of the fish, as much as they wanted. After everyone was full, Jesus told his disciples, now gather the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they picked up the pieces and filled 12 baskets with scraps left by the people who had eaten from the five barley loaves. Twelve baskets. I think it's interesting there were twelve disciples. And Jesus was testing them. And he sent each disciple home with a doggy bag. Well, as we look at this story today, I, I want to fill in some gaps a little bit. You see, in the Bible, we have, we have four accounts of the life of Jesus by four men who walked with Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Four different men who write about the life of Jesus and the same experiences that they all had with Jesus, but they all write from their own perspective, from their own personality. Therefore, when you read all of the accounts, the gaps are all filled in, you get a bigger picture, and you're going to be able to relate to what some of the other writers shared because your personality might line up with some of them. So we're going to look today at the whole story. It's, it's recorded in Matthew chapter 14 and Mark chapter 6 and in Luke chapter 9. All four authors record this story, so it must be important to Jesus to get it to us. So... Let's look at what happened. And, and, and if you'll allow me a little bit of liberty, I like to put myself in the situation to make it more real. Sometimes we read through Scripture and, and we just read past some things, but put yourself there today, if you will. First of all, we need to consider some of the events that led up to this, where John just briefly says, sometime later, the other writers share what happened during that time. You see, the disciples had just gotten back from an evangelistic trip, a ministry trip. Jesus sent them out, and, and he told them to go out in ministry, to heal the sick, to minister to people, and they had incredible response. They came back so pumped up. They couldn't believe it. They said, Jesus, we saw, we saw demons cast out of people. We saw lame people walking again. The sick were healed. Incredible things happened. And, we, and one of the authors even tells us that, that many were being baptized, were being converted and baptized by the disciples. What an incredible high. But they came back from this experience only to learn that John the Baptist the one who had led many of them to Jesus, John the Baptist, had been beheaded. Have you ever noticed that sometimes God will do something so incredible in your life and then you, that's followed up by something that just seems to knock the wind out of you? Perhaps it's a test. Mark says in, in his writings about this story, he says, as a result of all this, Jesus said, to his disciples, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going. I mean, this had created quite a stir. 
People were being healed. People were being baptized. Lives were being transformed. And people started gathering around. And it, the Bible says Jesus said this to them about getting away because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his disciples didn't even have time to eat. Pastor Andrew shared with us last week about the woman at the well and how Jesus showed up there tired and hungry. Well, the disciples are now at a place where they are tired and hungry. And talk about a range of emotions from seeing people healed and the miraculous done to, to, their, to their dear friend and mentor losing his life. And they haven't had time to eat. There's people all around them. Jesus said, we need to get alone. We need to get away. So they get in a boat to cross to the other side where they could find a place, hopefully, to retreat for a while. But no sooner did they step from the boat and there were thousands of people that began to gather all around them. The people saw them going and they all started going. So now there's a crowd of perhaps 20,000 people that are gathered around and, and we learn from the Gospels that Jesus had compassion on them. They were he and his disciples were tired and hungry, emotionally drained, but he had compassion on them. And so he began teaching. And we learn from the other writers that he began teaching and he went on and on and on and on. In fact, I love the way some of the writers say it. One says, till it was late in the day. Another one says, when the day began to wear away, Jesus is going on and on. Now place yourself in the place of the disciples. This huge range of emotions. You're tired, you're hungry. And now there's thousands of people and Jesus decides to start teaching and doing a sermon series all in one day so he's teaching it's going on and on the disciples are over here Jesus had compassion on them but the disciples are they're getting they're hungry probably Peter because he always put his foot in his mouth you know Peter probably said to the others guys when is he gonna stop I'm about to starve to death and it's getting late we're on the other side of the lake. There, there's no place to eat here. There are no restaurants. It's getting late. What are we going to do? And they're conferring among themselves, saying, I, I don't know. I mean, <laughs> you know, who's going to say anything to him? You know, and so they're talking about this, and then finally one of them says, you know what? Why don't you go tell him the people have to be hungry? He seems to care about them. He has compassion on them. So, so I've got an idea. Why don't you go tell, let's go tell Jesus the people are hungry and it's getting late. And for them, we need to shut this thing down. And, and so John tells us in his writing that, I don't know if they cast lots or whatever, but somehow Philip became the one that had to go to Jesus. Philip drew the short straw, and so Philip goes to Jesus, and he says, uh, Jesus, excuse me, sir, folks, pardon me for Jesus, I I'm sorry. Th this is really good, you know? I mean, this, this whole sermon series you're delivering all in one day, it's, this is really, really good, and we're really, I mean, we're, we're, we're just really enjoying this, Lord. This is really awesome, but you know, we, we're concerned about the people. You know, they, they, it, it, it's, it's really getting late, and, you know, everything, all the restaurants are getting ready to close, and, and I, they have to be hungry. And we're just concerned about the people. And so I can see Jesus saying, so, Philip, uh, you're, you're concerned for the people. Yeah, yeah, it's all about the people. I mean, we could go on forever. I mean, but, but you know, the people. Well, Philip... Okay, I see. You're concerned about the people getting food. Tell you what, you feed them. Uh, excuse me? Um, Lord, I, 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 
if all of us were working for almost a year, I don't think we could come up with enough money to buy food for all of these people. Okay, so Philip has to go back to the other disciples. And they say, all right, what did he say? What did he say? Is he going to, is he going to shut it down so we can all go get something to eat? Well, uh, no, not exactly. Well, what did he say? What did he say? Well, he said, you feed me. What? <laughs> I said, you feed me. What? He said that we're supposed to feed them. What? How are we supposed to feed the people? How are we supposed to do this? Have you ever had God ask something of you that you felt like you just weren't sufficient to do? How are we supposed to do this? Well, John tells us that when Jesus asked them to feed the people, it was actually a test. It was a test for Philip, but it was a test for all the disciples. It was a test for you and me. The test would expose something about them. The test would expose their true motives. It would open their eyes to see how quickly, how very quickly they could become so self-focused again and miss the calling of God in their lives. Have you noticed that about yourself? I notice that about me all the time. One moment, I can feel so high and pumped up about doing things for God. And the next moment, I realize I'm so self-centered and self-focused. I'm missing opportunities all around me. The test was to expose their true motives. It was also to expose their true perspective. Whether they were going to lean on their own limited resources or trust in an unlimited God. What was, what was their perspective going to be? Right now, they had a very carnal, earthly, limited perspective. We can't provide for these people. We, there's no way we could even come up with enough money to buy them all food. We aren't enough. We aren't enough. In fact, when he went back, I love Philip's response initially to Jesus. He says, are you expecting us to go buy enough food for this whole crowd? Sometimes we, we feel like God just wants something from us more than what we can give. But I want to tell you this morning, it's not that God wants something from you. When you're going through a test in your life, it's not that God wants something from you. It's that he wants something for you. And that's what he wanted them to understand. When Philip reports back to the others, what's their response? Their response reveals and exposes their true motives and their perspective. First of all, they say, it's late. This isn't the right time. This is a remote place. This isn't the right place. And we don't have the resources. I'm not the right person. How many times have you given those excuses to God when he's called you to something that seems so much bigger than what you are? It's not the right time, Lord. It's just not the right time. That this isn't the right place. Maybe somewhere down the road, but this isn't the right time or the right place. And God, I'm not the right person. I'm not the right, I just can't do this. Well, the disciples are all conferring and they're, they're complaining over there because they're just looking at what they have and it's not enough. What they have is not enough. What are we supposed to do? Well, at least Andrew says, well, I guess we better start looking around, seeing what we can find. So Andrew finds a boy with, with two fish and five loaves, a little boy that had just gotten back from the fish and chips place, and he got extra rolls. <laughs> so he sees that, little, that lunch from the little boy, and Andrew gets that, and he says, well, I can't find anything else, but... but it's something. You know, I can just imagine Peter, he grabs one of the rolls and starts to take a bite. And, and uh, Andrew says, Peter, put that down. That's for the people. Well, so finally, this is all they could find. So they said, well, take it to Jesus. So, so Philip goes back to Jesus. And he says, look, Lord, we, we heard what you said about, about us feeding the people. And... It, we feel like you're expecting more of us than what we can, can do right now. But, but we did find this one small lunch 
just two fish and five loaves, but it, it's not enough. It's, it's not enough for such a huge crowd as this. Have you ever noticed that when you look at the need and how big and huge the need is in your life, then you begin to feel insufficient? 5,000 people. What can we do? You get overwhelmed when you look at the size of the need through the lens of your own limited resources. How many times have we faced tests like this? Maybe it's a financial crisis in your life. Perhaps that financial crisis you're going through right now is simply a test. And how you respond is going to expose your perspective. Whether you have faith in an unlimited God or whether you are trusting in your few fish and loaves, your limited resources. How you respond, whether you say, well, I guess I, you know, we've been tithing, but we just can't afford to tithe this week, or we got to hold back on some of it this week. We had this unexpected bill, and, and things are happening in our lives right now, and, and God uh, got to understand. God understands that what's being exposed is your true perspective. You don't trust him. Maybe you're presented with a need, and it seems huge. It seems so big. How can we possibly do that? It's so big. And how you respond will reveal your heart, will reveal your motives. Maybe, it's, maybe it, it could be anything from a, a homeless person on the corner to a family in the church that is experiencing a crisis in their life and they have a great need right now and it seems so big, you think, what can I do? How do you respond? Maybe it's a, a need for a volunteer in a certain area of ministry, but you feel insufficient for that. We, we need more first impression folks right now. We need people that are directing traffic in so they know that this isn't a car lot, there's a church back here. We, we need people greeting and setting an atmosphere of, of, of anticipation in the hearts of people as they come in. But you might be feeling like, ah, but I, you know what? I work all week long. I just, there's not enough. I don't have enough time. I don't get enough sleep. I need to sleep in on Sunday mornings. Or I'm not good with people. I don't know what to say to them. I just don't, I'm not, there's not enough. There's not enough. And it's a test. Is it about you or is it about God? Or, or maybe you're thinking, you know what? I tried serving before. I got up and I shared in that small group or that Sunday school class and I got tongue-tied and I made a fool of myself and I'll never do that again. Who were you doing it for? You or God? You see, every test exposes our true motives. So Jesus turns to Philip and he says, uh, so all you have are two fish and five loaves. He said, yeah, yeah, Lord, that's all, that's all, that's all we could come up with. And I, I mean, it's, it's really not enough. It's really not enough even to feed the 12 of us, but, you know, much less 20,000 people. And the Lord said, okay, give it to me. That's enough. Give it to me. That would be enough. And so Jesus says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to, to have the people sit down in groups of 50. Divide them up. 20,000 people. And I want you to sit them in groups of 50. Talk about a test. Have you ever tried to work with people? <laughs> have you ever tried in a crowd of 20,000 people to get them to listen to you? To divide them up in groups of 50? Wow. Wow. So he said, I want you to break it down into groups of 50. And then we're told that Jesus took what little insufficient amounts that they had. And the Bible says, when we read the other writers, they fill us in a little bit more on what Jesus did when he took it. He took this small lunch. And the Bible says he gave thanks. He gave thanks for it. So often we're just complaining about what we don't have instead of giving thanks for what God's trusted us with and what we do have. Jesus gave thanks to God and then he broke it. 
and he blessed it. You see, little becomes much once it's been blessed by the master's hand. And then he gave it back to the disciples to give to the people. Now, I, I, think, I think that maybe the disciples kind of figured out, they kind of thought they knew what was going to happen, but I think they got it wrong. I think they thought because they remembered the Old Testament. Well, it wouldn't have been called the Old Testament to them. They remembered the scripture that they had read and, and learned through the years. They remembered when Elijah, I think it was in 1 Kings chapter 4, had, um, had a man that, was, um, that, that had 20 loaves of bread, but there was a group of, again, we were told 100 men. We don't know how many people total. And Elijah said, well, will you give what you have to feed the men? And the man said, it's not enough. I've got 20 loaves of bread and there's 100 men. And Elijah said, I need you to give what you have. And ended up, everybody ate and was full and there were leftovers. I think they probably thought of that. Ah, this is what's going to happen. This is going to happen like it happened for Elijah because here's one that's greater than Elijah. So this is what's going to happen. He's going to multiply it. Then they probably thought of the story when Elijah told the widow woman who, who had a son and they were down to their last meal and he told her just use it to fix something for me. Give it away. And, and when she did, her cupboard never was bare. It just, she, it kept filling up again. So they probably thought, I know what's going to happen. We're putting it in the hands of Jesus. Ah, we get it now. We're a little slow, but we get it. We're putting it in the hands of Jesus. He's going to multiply it so all the people can eat and be full. But I think they had it wrong. Because I think they felt and thought the same things that you and I often feel like. God you multiply and provide so I can give. And that's not the way it worked. The Bible says that Jesus blessed it and he gave it to the disciples. It hadn't been multiplied yet to give to the people. It didn't multiply in the master's hand. It multiplied in the disciples' hands when they gave it away. It was that step of faith. It was a test of faith and of obedience. I, I can imagine what it must have been like. So Jesus thanks God. He prays over it. He blesses it. He breaks it. And he gives a little piece to Peter. Peter, give it to the people. Are you through? You want to pray over this some more? Um, Peter, just start feeding the people. Give it away. Okay. Break off a tiny piece. <laughs> just a tiny piece. I said tiny. <laughs> And he keeps going around giving peace after peace. And then something amazing happens when he gets down to the last little piece of that loaf. And the next person takes it. There's more. And he keeps going and going. And it multiplied in the disciples' hands when they gave it away. The miracle didn't happen in the hands of Jesus. The miracle happened in the hands of the disciples. It had to be blessed in the hands of Jesus. But then it was multiplied when, it, when the disciples trusted and obeyed and gave it away. So there's three principles that I think Jesus wanted his disciples to learn and he wants you and me to learn today from this test. Number one, open your eyes to what God has entrusted to you. 
Stop complaining about what you don't have. Stop saying, I'll start tithing when God will bless my income and multiply. Then I'll start trusting him with my tithe and giving away. That's not the way it works. I'll serve when things change for me. Right now, my life is too hectic. When God changes my situation, when he brings multiplication to my life, then I'll start. Now, instead, look at what you do have. Take an inventory of what you do have so that you might present it to Jesus. What are the resources you have? What's he placed in your life right now? What can you do now? What can you give away today? He had him divide the people up into groups of 50. Sometimes, like I said, we get so overwhelmed when we see the, the huge, the, 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 the bigness of the need in front of us. And I think what he was telling his disciples is stop worrying about that Start breaking it down into what you can do with what you've got today, with the people that I've surrounded you with today, this smaller group. Do what you can. Most of you have heard the story about the little boy walking along the seashore and he saw there were starfish all over the beach. And he knew they would die if they didn't get back in the ocean. So he would pick up a starfish and throw it back out in the ocean. And he'd pick up another one. And some, some man walked along and he said, son, what are you doing? He said, well, I'm trying to save these starfish. He said, son, there's thousands of them on the beach. There's no way you can save all of them. And the little boy picked another one up and threw it in. He said, no, but I saved that one. See, that's what Jesus is asking of you. We, what do you have? What has he trusted you with right now? Will you give what you have right now? instead of being overwhelmed by the big need. I think if, if, we, if we listen to God's promises in his word, he says, if you're faithful in the small things that I've given you right now, I'll trust you with greater things. It'll be multiplied. You'll be amazed at the multiplication of resources God will trust you with tomorrow if you'll be faithful with what you have right now today. So open your eyes to what God has entrusted to you. Secondly, it has to be blessed before it can multiply in your life. Whatever God's given you, whatever he's trusted you with, it has to be blessed. Your time, your money, your resources, whatever he's trusted you with, it has to be blessed in order for it to multiply. And it's only blessed in the hands of Jesus. So commit what you have to him. My possessions, my money, my time, I give it all to him that he might bless it. And often what he'll do is what he did at this point. He'll break it. He'll break your plans. He'll break even what you thought you desired, what you thought was going to be best for you. He'll break it. It won't look like what it did before. But he's got something better for you if you'll let him bless what he's trusted you with. And then the third principle is this. It has to be given away for the miracle to happen. It's not just receiving the blessing. If the disciples would have never gone out and started distributing it to the people, they never would have seen the multiplication. They would have never seen the miracle. It has to be given away for the miracle to happen. That miracle won't happen in your life until you take that step of faith and obedience. Remember the story Jesus told about the, about the, the talents that he entrusted to different servants. One had five, one had two, one had only one. And the one with only one held on to it, buried it was too afraid to give it away. He was probably thinking and saying, if I had five like that guy, then I could tithe. If I had five like that guy, then I could serve and I could do the things that he's doing, but I only have one. And so he held on to it, and Jesus gave this warning. He said, if you hold on to your life, you'll lose it. But if you're willing to give it away because the command, the commission to you and me is to feed them, feed the multitudes, Feed them. God's trusted us with something that we might use it to feed the multitudes. 
If you give it away, you release God to do the miracle, to multiply. You see, these phrases we see in this story are so common to us. It's not enough, God. I don't have enough. I'm insufficient. I'm not qualified. It's not enough. And God's looking at us saying, this is a test. I want you to feed them. I want you to use what you've got to give it away. Malachi 3, 10 and 11. For those of you who feel like, you know what, I can't, I can't tithe. It's, it sounds good, but I don't, there's not 10% extra income for me right now. There's not 10% extra. I don't have enough. When I figure up all my bills, there's not enough. God says this, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I won't throw open the windows, the floodgates of heaven, and pour out so much blessing that you won't have enough room for it. See if I won't prevent things from destroying what you have. Watch me provide for you in your life, but you have to give it away. Start with where you're at right now. And in obedience, give it away. When you give it to God, he says, then you've, you've released me to do the miracle that I might bring multiplication, that I might bring blessing. And I can promise you this. If you will test God in this, if you'll bring your 10%, your tithe to him, your 90% will go further than 100% ever could have taken you. Because he'll multiply it. But if you don't get his blessing on it by obeying, it's never going to be multiplied. You're going to keep struggling. You're going to keep struggling with your bills. But if you want to see God's blessing and his multiplication in your life, understand that everything he's given you isn't treasure for your pleasure. It's tools for his purpose. And start pouring it out, giving it away. I don't have time to serve, Pastor Randy. I just don't have time. You don't understand what my job requires of me and, and the situation in my family right now. And I don't have time to find a place of service. Well, I want you to test God in this. If you'll obey him and you'll start giving him the time to serve, watch him add value to your rest, add value to your production at the other times of the day. Watch him multiply your life as you give to him. You say, I, I feel like God's telling me to, to, to share with someone, to talk to someone about him, but I'm not very good at that. I'm not enough. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to talk to people and lead them to Christ. Say what you know. Share what you can. Take what God's trusted you with and begin giving it away and watch the Holy Spirit come and begin speaking through you in ways that you could have never imagined on your own. He'll multiply. He'll multiply if you'll just give it away. But we have to give it away to see the miracle happen. How about it? Are you going to pass the test God's taking you through? Let me share with you something that just got me so excited as I was studying this this week. In Acts chapter 4, after Jesus had already died and rose again and ascended into heaven, the Bible says that the disciples were now responsible to feed the multitudes, to share the good news. And so in Acts chapter 4, we're told that all the believers were united in heart and mind, and they felt that what they owned was not their own. They're getting it. They're passing the test. So they shared everything they had. And God's great blessing was upon them. And there were no needy people among them. Because God multiplied what they did. Now, here's the exciting thing. Guess what the scripture says in just a couple of verses before this? It says the number of believers had grown to about 5,000 men. Earlier, they saw 5,000 men, 
20,000 people fed because they were willing to obey Jesus. And now later, there's 5,000 men, 20,000 believers that are gathered together and they've learned the lesson. They've passed the test. It's not mine, it's his. And so I bring it to him that he might bless it and I give it away that he might multiply it and his kingdom grows. How about it? Are you going to pass the test? Are you going to pass the test? I know some of you right now, you feel insufficient. It's scary. It's scary to give away my little loaf. It doesn't feel like it's enough. It's not what God's, ask, what God's trying to get from you. It's what he wants for you. Will you give yourself completely to him?